Good afternoon, folks. I uh, first want to welcome all of you to uh, this uh, special luncheon that we have scheduled today. It's our second year. Um, we look forward to having uh, many more uh, years to come. We, the first person I really want to introduce that uh, really makes this happen is uh, Jane Grace. Jane, could you stand up and we want to thank you for that. She's our committee chair here for the Kiwanis Club of uh, Lakewood Ranch. And for those of you I haven't met or don't know me, I'm Andres Rincon. I'm the uh, president of the Kiwanis uh, Club of Lakewood Ranch. We meet every Tuesday here at the Polo Grill from 12 to 1 for lunch. Everybody's welcome. We have guest speakers. Our, uh, our meetings are, are very exciting. Uh, and uh, we look forward to having you guys join us uh, on a Tuesday or even become a member, which is even better. Once you ex experience the, uh, uh, one of our meetings, I think you'll, uh, you'll be, uh, be converted to one of our members. So please uh, come join us at one of our meetings. As we start our, our meetings every, every Tuesday, we uh, kind of like to start with, the, uh, with a prayer. And uh, Mr. Tom Daly, uh, would you like to lead us into, into prayer, please? Thank you, Andreas. I'm going to ask you to rise, and if you could, remain standing after the prayer for our pledge. Let's just take a moment and get focused on our God. Dear God, we lift up our hearts and our minds today. We thank you for your presence here with us. We know you are with us. We thank you for the privilege of life in a free country. We lift up the members of our military, serving now in our veterans, particularly those suffering from physical and psychological harm as a result of their service. We ask you to give us an attitude of service to our community, no matter what our role is in our community. We ask you to bless this meeting and the meal that we share together we bring these petitions and those that remain in the silence of our hearts to you. We pray in your name. Amen. You want to start the pledge? Yep. Thank you, Tom. Uh, at this moment, I'd like to introduce uh, David Watchdog Miner, who's going to uh, do our Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, just to maybe, if you guys don't know, uh, Dave Miner is also the incoming president of Kiwanis of Anna Maria Island. So. I'm sure he'll uh, enjoy guests at his Thank club. You. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. If you all join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, David. Thank you. All right. You guys, please sit down. At this point, I'd like to introduce uh, also one of the individuals responsible for this event, uh, Ms. Uh, Julie Aranabar, school board. Thank you. Good morning and welcome everyone to our second annual Kiwanis Luncheon. Oops. And before we get going, and I do any more damage here, thanks Andres. Um, I just want to thank you that this is a Saturday with beautiful weather and at every one of these tables here today are people that have been dedicated to our community and service to our community in so many ways. And um, when, as about 5 a.m. as I started to type the names in the tables for today, I was reminded of so many past experiences, board members, work, things in the community. There's not a place I've been or a thing that I have not done that took me to this place that all of you have not been part of. So I am well aware of what Manatee County can do and does every day. So I just want to thank you all for being here today. Thank you. <laughs> and now I would like to introduce you to our chair of the school board, Karen Carpenter. And Karen, it has been a, a pleasure to serve with someone who comes to work every day 
packs her ego in her bag, sets it at the door, and sits down and gets to work. So I want to thank you all and welcome Karen Carpenter. Thank you all for being here. I'm a very proud um, member of Kiwanis, and we, what we share is our love of children and our service to children. Uh, and I couldn't agree more with Vice Chair Aranabar about uh, our dedication to uh, moving the school district forward. I want to tell you a little bit about Kiwanis International. It's a co-educational service club. Women were not always in the club, but we are now welcome. It was founded in 1915 and headquartered in Indianapolis, Indiana. Some of you who are from Indiana can be very proud of that's where uh, it's, it's headquartered. The current membership of Kiwanis is 240,000 members worldwide. That's 7,700 clubs in 18 countries. That's pretty awesome. In Bradenton, we, or Manatee County, we have seven clubs. And we meet different times, we can rotate around, and I hope that you all consider joining. Uh, two of our speakers uh, today, Mr. Rick Mills and Dr. Carol Probesfield, are brand new members, thank you very much, of the downtown Bradenton Kiwanis. And so I'm very happy that they are here with us. Our service leadership programs are in elementary schools, K-Kids, middle schools, builders clubs, and we're also known for our high school key clubs. Um, we have this little program here. I know you can all read. Some of us are high school graduates uh, <laughs> among our backgrounds. And, but please read this and please consider uh, joining us. Uh, and guests are always welcome. Uh, we have wonderful programs that we learn about what's going on in the community. And at one of our downtown Kiwanis clubs, we learned about the Lemur Conservation Re Preserve in Mayaka, and I don't know if any of you knew about that, but you know, this is a wonderful county with all sorts of, um, of, of great features and programs, but this is a great way to give back, and especially uh, coming into common, uh, we're in common service and common ground and cause, uh, helping uh, our children in this community. Thank you again for being here. I know you'll enjoy um, the four speakers, uh, five speakers rather, there are gonna be five of them up here, and I uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. I was asked earlier um, if we're having a dance afterwards because the dance floor is laid out. Um, there, il there will be a dance here tonight, but tonight, as soon as we leave, this room will be broken down and then reset up for the Manatee High School prom. So, um, yeah, you know, sometimes things just all work together. I know, so there's the big jumbo TV over there that's covered up nicely for our luncheon. And um, I wish the Manatee High School students a wonderful evening of celebration tonight. Thank you. And our first speaker that I'm going to introduce to you is um, just back yesterday from Washington where she testified about a new bill that she's had the honor of having it named after her and it's for foster care children that many times, as you know, are separated, um, put into different areas. And, and um, she may tell you a little bit about this bill, but it's actually named the Nancy Dietert bill. So I want to welcome our Senator Nancy Dietert. Good afternoon. It's nice to be here. And I see you're mostly educators, so I'm going to defer everything to Senator Galvano, the Chair of Education Appropriations. All of your wants and dreams and hopes are in his hands. So go see Bill at this table right over here. And he has billions of dollars for education. <laughs> Yay, go Bill. <laughs> he, he took on a chore that I, I rejected, frankly. I'm like, no thanks. Uh, it's a big budget, it's a great budget, but um, he's got a lot of problems there that needed to be solved, and I think education had a very good year. Um, the, the only bill that I recall doing this year was for guidance counselors at the um, request of guidance counselors. They now want to be called um, school, what did we call them, Bill? Yeah, I liked the title Guidance Counselor, but they didn't. So we renamed them whatever title it is they like better. And the, the focus was supposed to be um, 
Guidance counselors are the most educated people in the building, and we are currently and often using them uh, to do lunchroom duty and bus stop duty at a time when school safety is um, in the forefront of everyone's mind. So under this bill, they should be used for the use that they were hired. Wow, what is, there's a knife up here if you want to kill yourself in the middle of your speech. I didn't bring the knife, I swear. <laughs> Here you go, thanks. So really, the, my focus this year, I chaired Commerce, I served with Senator Galvano on education appropriations. We all served on numerous committees. I served on Children and Families. And in the Children and Families Committee, we did a total rewrite of foster care, which I hope you read about because it's a huge accomplishment and it does relate to education. We found that um, because of our laws that we wrote to protect kids in our care, to keep them safe from harm, we, we overdid it and deprived them of any kind of natural childhood, especially in their teenage years. Most of them testified before our committee saying they've never been to the prom because a lot of proms have those lockdowns where you stay all night Foster care kids can't stay the night with people who haven't had a background check or been fingerprinted. We had testimony from uh, foster parents who had a three-year-old. They had to write a letter to the Department of Children and Family and ask, is it okay if we get the kids haircut? And they didn't get a response for three months. Probably somewhere along the line, somebody gave the kid a mohawk or something and then there a new rule comes forth. So we found that only 2% of foster care kids um, have a driver's license and can drive a car. Little things that you just don't think about. If you're in foster care and you're living with foster parents, they're not going to put you on their insurance policy. So with no car insurance, no proof of insurance, you can't get a driver's license and therefore they don't have one. Then on their 18th birthday, we were putting them out in the street and hoping they make it. And guess how that turned out? Most of them didn't make it. They were ending up homeless or in prison. So under the new law, law which I'm just thrilled to have named after me, at their choice, they can either stay in foster care till they're 21 or leave when they're 18. And the caring part of the legislation is if they change their mind, they can come back. Because at 18, you're making a really important decision and you think you're gonna do great, and then you go out there in the world and it's maybe not what you thought it was and we allow you to come back with a couple of months notice and you can go back and forth as many times as you want. And I think that's legislation Florida can be proud about and we just testified in Washington because they may want to use this as a model for the nation. So. I think one of the things we do as Floridians, <laughs> thanks. We love to make fun of our government. We, we've all moved here from another state. We like to beat up on our state like we're 35th and everything. And frankly, as you go around the nation, we are number one in a lot of things. So, you know, learn to brag about your state because we are doing a lot of good things. And I think we had a great session and I look forward to any questions you may have later. Thank you. Thank you, and um, Nancy Dieter, prior to her term in the House before the Senate, also served two terms on the school board and has been a great mentor for me in my leadership walk with Mantee County. And one of the things that um, Kiwanis is about, it is about leadership, but it's in leadership through service to others. And um, I would like to thank you, Nancy, for all of the phone calls and times that you have spent with me, and it has truly helped me along the way. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce the man who has all the money and who is uh, going to head us up. And you know, one of the, the things about having Bill Galvano in our Senate is that for Manatee County, many of our senior legislature termed out. So to have Bill transfer over to the Senate the way he has really put Manatee County in a prominent position. And it also gave Senator Galvano an opportunity to be in just the right spot at just the right time. 
He is one of ours. He is a father. He's raising his children here in Manatee County. And next week, there'll be the Bill Gavano Golf Classic, which was started in the honor of his father. And of all the people that I've met in Manatee County, there's been uh, generations in history of supporting education and children. Welcome, Senator Bill Gavano. Good afternoon. It's uh, great to be back in Manatee County. This is uh, such a wonderful place, and you really get to missing it when you're in Tallahassee for a long time. And so when I'm home, it's, uh, it's great to be here. And, and Jane, thank you for your leadership on this event. And Julie, you as well, and, and the leadership in the community, on the school board, we really appreciate it. Before I go on, I, I have to uh, highlight something. And, Senator Dieter is very modest, when, and she was modest when she was up here speaking. But if the Senate had was a sports team, Senator Nancy Dieter would be the most valuable player. She has. She had an outstanding session. I learned from her in the Senate, as I have in the past, and Nancy, it's an absolute honor to not only serve with you, but to sit next to you on the Senate floor so I could say, how are we voting on this? <laughs> and she, has it, she didn't uh, give me any bad advice all session. So I appreciate it, but really, I, I'm just so pleased, and you should be so, so very proud. Uh, this has been a busy week since I've returned from Tallahassee. An exciting week, though. Uh, how many of you have heard about the uh, Coca-Cola expansion with the uh, citrus? Right? That is absolutely vital to our state. 25,000 acres of citrus being planted at a time when we are under siege from, from greening. If you looked at the Bradenton Herald today and many papers throughout the state, there was a or uh, articles on the effect of greening and the impact that it's having in the state and the impact that it's having right here in Manatee County. So to have a company like Coca-Cola, as Commissioner Put Putnam said, double down in the citrus industry at this time is really wonderful. It's very important. And I can tell you that a lot of my time out of the legislature over the next several months will be helping in any way I can to, to promote not just that project, but to continue to uh, uh, work on the greening issue and, and see that we can make some progress. We did appropriate $8 million this year to help with the research on greening, and that goes along with federal dollars that have come into the state, and also with uh, uh, a private investment from the citrus industry to try to address this issue. From a session standpoint, this year, this was my ninth regular session, and it was probably the most bipartisan, um, controlled, respectful, productive sessions I've seen in many, many years. And I have to uh, give credit to our Senate President, Don Gates, for doing a phenomenal job as uh, the presiding officer within the chamber, for making sure there was a free flow of ideas, making sure that not just his, but the members' priorities got heard, irrespective of political party. And just a little footnote, it was actually President Don Gates who did the amendment that named the very good legislation for foster kids, the Nancy Dietert uh, Common Sense Foster Care Act. And so he stepped down from the, yes. <laughs> Deserves applause, because I have never seen that. He gave the uh, gavel, to the pro tem and he stepped down from the dais and went into the chamber and got at his desk and a lot of us were wondering well what's what's he doing and uh, he's offered an amendment we weren't sure if it was going to pass <laughs> so for, that's an inside joke the presiding officer it, it had a good shot and uh, and he offered the amendment and so it was was really cool but that's just an example of the type man he is and the way he recognized the needs of of the uh, the members. From a, a 40,000 foot level, we, we did get a lot done. Ethics reform, very important. Raise the bar for ourselves as, as members and for others who would seek public office throughout the state. Election reform, recognizing that Florida has continued to have 
trouble when it comes time to vote, and we took great steps to improve that, that process. Another uh, sales tax holiday. Uh, we also prioritized the uh, uh, career opportunities from a policy standpoint within the, the world of education and, and certainly within the, the marketplace. For me, personally, chairing the Education Appropriations Committee, it was a, quite a learning curve. I mean, I had obviously served in the legislature and been on appropriations committees, but at, at this level, I had to delve into it at a very detailed level. And I was glad to have a great committee. Nancy, of course, as she mentioned, was on that committee with me. And we did some great things, in my opinion, and hopefully in yours as well. Uh, this was one of the most aggressive education budgets we've had in maybe a decade. $5 million increase for early learning. And, and remember, this budget goes from early learning all the way through the university system. So it's not compartmentalized. But we started with early learning by increasing the funding there. And then with the K-12, we increased it by $1.1 billion. $1.1 billion for our students. And, and we did it by also recognizing the increased workload. Uh, per student funding was up almost to 7% increase. In Manatee County, that means 22 million additional dollars for our K through 12 system that we can spend. Within that, within that FEFP or the Florida Education Finance Program, we address the governor's priority of increasing uh, teacher pay. $480 million was designated for that. As a legislature, we, we tied it to uh, merit but gave maximum flexibility to the districts. We did that through conforming bill, and so the districts can choose themselves whether they're going to apply the proviso language or come up with their own plan on how to distribute those dollars. And we spread the um, opportunity further than just the classroom teachers, but guidance counselors and other instructional personnel that are so vital within the, the world of education. Within the state college system, we increased funding across the board, including a $33 million, uh, what I call an equity supplement to make sure everyone was coming up. But at the same time, we gave new direction to our college system with regard to remedial education. And we have reprioritized to have developmental education within our college system. And what that means is this, that we want our college systems to encourage and have students going into credit earning courses and provide the additional help as part of that type of coursework versus students just going into remedial non-credit courses and dropping out after a, hey Linda, dropping out after a uh, year or two. The statistics were horrible. And a lot of these young people and older people, this is adult education too, could make it happen without, without having to spend several semesters in non-credit courses. And then the university system, we started by restoring $300 million that uh, were utilized last year in other parts of the budget. So we, we put that back in at the, at the start and then we're very aggressive in funding the, uh, the projects that the members prioritize within the university system. And we've also established a preeminence program, an online university, and I'll, and I'll leave you with this because I know there's questions. And from a fixed capital standpoint, $355 million in fixed capital projects throughout the state. So I think we have a lot to be proud of in education. I'm sure we're gonna talk more about it, but it's uh, always a pleasure to be with you, and it's certainly a pleasure to serve you in the Senate. Thank you. One day I um, was doing some dishes in the kitchen, and it was a Sunday morning, and Meet the Press was on. And they said, after the commercial break, we're going to come back with Robert with a Meet the Press Minute, which is when they go back into the film clips and pull out an old clip. 
And the clip that they pulled out, was they said, was going to be from 1959. So I thought, well, that was the year I was born. So there's a big disclosure there. And, um, <clears throat> and I thought, I, I wonder what Robert Frost had to say in 1959 on Meet the Press. And when the show came back on, um, they asked him one question. What will it be? What will be the hardest thing for the next generation? So in 1959, if you think of where we were as a history for our, county, for our country, he said the hardest thing for this next generation will be that they will reap the yield of the greatest harvest ever sown, but they will never know the pain of what it took to sow the seeds. So as I stand here today, we now have more members in our key clubs than we have in Kiwanis. And um, so, you know, you could look at that and say, well, you know, we, we probably need some more adult leaders. But I sort of look at that, and after attending the Golden Herald Awards the other night, where I was actually the proud mother of a nominee of a Golden Herald, and having been an advisor and watching those students go on the stage, many of whom I have known, actually Mrs. Swartling is here today, and Mrs. Swartling sent me out into the hall as a volunteer parent with a little girl who came from China in third grade. That girl stood in the Golden Herald stage. So there are people here today, when I tell you from every table, who have touched children's lives and made a difference. And that's why it's so easy to do what I do. And um, I thought about that Robert Frost mi uh, minute, and I thought about the year that we had the money, actually more money in our budget, but it came at a time where we've paid a very big price in our economy. And one of the things that's happening is right now, it doesn't really matter so much if you're a Democrat or Republican or where you are, because we're starting to realize what is most important. And even in this room today, there's a true spirit of collaboration, no matter where you are or what you do, because all of us understand that um, the children really are our future. And even today in our audience, we have three county commissioners. We have Carol Whitmore, we have Betsy Benack, and who, and Vanessa, where is Vanessa? I, Vanessa, I haven't even seen you. So what, what that tells you is, even as our legislative leaders are here, our community leaders are here, and we are truly collaborating in partnerships across the way. And as I get ready to introduce our next speakers, that is also you're going to see very evident in our colleges, because we have two colleges who are working side by side for programming and other things that you're going to hear about today that's for the betterment of our communities and for our children. So with that, I would like to introduce a new president at the State College of Florida, Dr. Carol Probesfield. <laughs> well, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to be here and talk to you a little bit about the State College of Florida. First, I'd like to thank um, Senators Galvano and Senator Dieter for your support and your care of the higher education and all the education system in our area. We thank you very, very much. Last week, the State College of Florida had the opportunity to celebrate this year's graduates, bringing our total graduates to 41,000 over 56 year history. We're very proud of our graduates, our alums, and our students. One of our alums, Senator Galvano, and I understand uh, Commissioner Whitmore as well. We are very proud of all of our graduates, and I want to take this opportunity, as Senator Dieter mentioned, to uh, talk about the great successes that we've had at our institution just this year with the young people that walked across our stage. Our PTK group won three out of 30 positions in the first all academic team in the state of Florida. That's 10%. That's a pretty good showing from this region and from the State College of Florida. We had two out of 50 Coca-Cola scholars that are named nationwide. Two came from the State College of Florida. Our Model UN team won first place in the Southeast region. That's against 44 colleges and universities for their position paper as representatives of the nation of South Korea. Our PBL, Phi Beta Lambda Club, won first, second, and third place honors in the state competition. Our student athletes were named All-Florida 
academic athletes, but also in their athletic endeavors. Three of our five teams went to the state championship, and one of our five teams went to the national championship. We now are in an institution that's approaching about 20% of our students are bright future students. And what makes all of that really special is that we're an open access institution, which means that students come to the State College of Florida who have a GED or a high school diploma. 56% of those students test into some level of remedial education. And as uh, Senator Galvano said, we're working on different models of how we deliver that remedial education for our students. But the interesting part is 56% come in in need of remedial education, yet when our graduates graduate, they do better on um, their examinations into the universities. They get better GPAs than the average of all the other state colleges in the state of Florida when they, or Florida when they go on to those universities. And they have better GPAs at universities than many of the students who start out at those universities. So I can't begin to tell you how proud we are of our graduates, but all of that boils down to one thing, and that's our faculty. Our teachers teach. They come to the State College of Florida to teach because they're passionate about teaching. They're not there to research. They're not there to publish. Some of them do, and some of them are quite noted in their fields of expertise, but they're there because they're passionate about teaching, and the proof is in the pudding. I think anybody, our partner USF, who me, 74% of our students who go on go to USF, can attest to the quality of the students that come from the State College of Florida. One of the other things I would like to share with you is many of the students come to us through the Department of Children's, or Children and Families. And that is the organization that sponsors the Road to Independence program that's near to Senator Dieter's heart. We as an institution were able to exempt about $88,000 worth of tuition last year alone for students that come to us through that pathway. We're very proud to do it and we look forward to more opportunities to doing the same. The other thing that's very important to me that I've been working on since I started in this role is our collaborations, relationships, and friendships with institutions and organizations in our area. We will be celebrating tomorrow at USF the opportunity to sign an artist to teacher uh, articulation agreement where students at the State College of Florida who have a background in um, the fine and performing and visual arts can go on and get their teacher certification at USF and take that expertise to them with them in the classroom. We're working on a new two plus two agreement with USF. We had a fine agreement several years ago. Uh, we let that lapse, but we're putting those parts back together in a new spirit of collaboration and partnership. We're sharing discussions with USF on a new biology degree and how we might be part of that and how we might work together to provide opportunities for students. We're looking at a an AA to BFA program with Ringling. We have our first student. As a matter of fact, if you make your way down the street, her artwork is on display today at the CARE presentation, and she's our first student to take advantage of that articulation agreement. We work with LECOM, where uh, we have an articulation program with their pharmacy program, and we're also using our Lakewood Ranch Medical Simulation Center to teach their medical students. So our facility is serving not only our nursing students, but their medical students as well. We also have several articulation agreements with our K-12 partners, including dual enrollment, also programs that involve all of the educational institutions in the area. One example would be the culinary program, where students will start out at the local technical institute. They'll make their way to the State College of Florida for their two-year degree, and then on to USF to get their bachelor degree. We have several programs like that that we're looking at. We have several programs that we do in conjunction with the local school district, fire science, emergency medical services, our LPN to RN program, many more examples. But we're working very hard to try and put as many of those in place as we possibly can because it's important to provide for our students and prospective students all the educational opportunities that we can because we know if they stay in our community to get their higher education, they will remain in this community, they will work in this community, and that's what we're trying to do. Coming forward in the next month or so, we have what many of us are referring to as the High Five Retreat. That's where we have higher education institutions from the area coming together to talk about what our unique, distinct niches are, what are some of the gaps in the delivery of service, how we can work together to fill those gaps so again we can provide all of those opportunities to students so they can stay in this area. That's our goal. Someday we all hope to retire. We're building this next generation and to the extent that we're building it together, we can only do the best thing for our community. Thank you very much.
Um, next, uh, this is a very interesting fact at USF, but this year will be uh, a new freshman class. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing about that. But one of the statistics that's very glaring for college is when you look at the number of students that go to college and the number that drop out before the end of their freshman year, and it's very hard to sustain a college when you can't look and project to the number of students that you're going to have from the first year through to the completion of the program. And I really want to commend both of our colleges that are here today for the time that has, and the energy that has been put into what is missing and what has to be done to give these students what they need to be successful. So with that, I would like to introduce um, Dr. Bonnie Jones, who's the US regional, USF Regional Chancellor for Academics at college. Well, good afternoon, and thank you so much, Kiwanis, for scheduling this luncheon in such a timely manner. It really gives us at USF Sarasota Manatee an opportunity to sincerely thank Senator uh, Dieter and Senator Galvano for what they've done for us. Uh, it, it just is a, an amazing thing to be able to have the kind of resources that we will have this year is in comparison to the past. Uh, I would like to introduce Casey Welch, if you'd stand. He's been our government affairs person working with both the senators and has given them a great deal of information on us. Uh, just to let you know, last year, uh, you heard that uh, the state universities lost $300 million uh, and those were restored thanks to the efforts of our two senators, that $300 million. USF Sarasota Manatee was slated to lose $3 million last year on a $20 million budget, but thanks to Senator Dietert, we had $2 million restored, so we didn't lose quite as much as we were anticipated uh, on that. And now this year, with both uh, Senator Dieter and Galvano, we now have an additional, all that $3 million restored, plus we received another $2 million for something that is missing on our campus, which is science. Many of you have maybe been reading in the papers about how we are going to have science laboratories, but they're special because they're going to be at Moat Marine Laboratory. There will be two laboratories there for our students to take science classes this fall. We're very excited about this collaboration, but it's made possible by that $2 million from uh, the legislature that is helping us to go forward with not just the labs and the equipment, but also faculty, which get very expensive in science. And we can have a lot of um, scholarships for students, but if we don't have what I call scholarships for faculty, meaning ways to pay for them, we can can't put a faculty member in front of a class to go forward. I also appreciate their assistance with our online coursework. About 40% of the classes at USF Sarasota Manatee are online, and they fill up often right away, the first ones to fill whenever we put the schedule out there. Uh, it, it, there was a chance that we might have lost that opportunity to have online courses, so I'm very thankful that our enrollment isn't going to drop 40% this year, thanks to the legislature's effort to keep us, us going in those online courses. We serve about 4,700 students at USF Sarasota Manatee, and we do hope to grow to about 10,000 in the next five to 10 years. It's only through the efforts of all of you leaders in this room to help us do that. Uh, we, what you hear sometimes about tuition and how state universities are using tuition. With our tuition increases, uh, we have really tried to do more with less. We became separately accredited at a time when our budget was going down, down, and they looked very closely at the credentials of your faculty. They found absolutely no issues with our faculty because we really prioritized how we used all of our funding as a state university. At uh, USF Sarasota Manatee, too, with the tuition increase, uh, the state mandated that we use 30% to fund grants to needy students so that the tuition increase didn't hit them as, uh, diff more as uh, difficult. 
uh, at USS Sarasota Manatee, we decided to give 40% to students, and we were able to increase 12% the number of students who received grants that were need-based, so they didn't have that tuition stretch. And we were also able to add 289 sections with that uh, tuition increase. When I mean, you figure there are 25 or 30 students in each class, uh, that really impacted a lot of students, and it increased our graduation rate in one year, 2%. And so we really feel like we're getting students out there in the community and having to spend less money. Um, one of the things I would like to uh, express my thanks for, too, is Byron Shin. If Byron, if you would stand. Byron is a member of both the USF trustees for the USF system and a member of our campus board here at USF Sarasota Manatee. He's done a lot to work with our business programs and supporting all of our programs. But I just wanted to share with you some success of our MBA program. Uh, there is a major field test that is given by Educational Testing Service out of Princeton, New Jersey. These are the people that bring you the SAT. They test uh, students across the country in hundreds of MBA programs, thousands of students. You know, you think of places like Wharton at Penn or MIT or Stanford or the other big state universities. USF Sarasota Manatee MBA students scored in the 91st percentile on the MBA nationalized test, 98% in marketing. So who would know little USF Sarasota Manatee has this strong of an MBA program? Uh, I, we also have at our table our Dean of Education, Terry Osborne, and uh, a member of our faculty in education, Dr. Dina Osborne. And uh, Carol mentioned uh, the partnerships uh, with our um, teacher degree that we are having with SCF and Ringling. Uh, but uh, Terry's faculty are working on what's called Partnerships for Arts Integrated Teaching, or PAINT. And this is where our faculty have done research on how students in elementary school learn. And oftentimes, it's through the arts that they learn math and science better. And so they, there are uh, arrangements with the Kennedy Center and the Lincoln Center up in New York and Washington, DC, for our faculty to work and teach our students how to teach in elementary schools better through that PAINT program. And then I'm so glad that Carol spoke a little bit about the partnerships we have with SCF. It really is going to be a new day. I think we, we used to have the model 2 plus 2 program in the state of Florida. I believe we will have even the model for the country on a 2 plus 2 program now uh, with, with the efforts. Uh, she mentioned where uh, they are supporting our biology degree, a bachelor's degree. Right now there is no bachelor's degree in biology in this area. And with the money that we have for STEM, we are going to be able to build that. We are looking at possibly using SCF labs in physics, because you still have to take physics for the biology program. And um, Carol herself sent Dr. Arthur Guilford a letter of support of our bachelor's degree, which will go to our Board of Governors as we get approval for that to start in fall of 2014. So we really appreciate that, Carol. Um, and uh, one of the other partnerships we have with SCF is we went out to LECOM, um, the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine, uh, faculty at SCF, our faculty, and LECOM, and we are very excited about partnerships that we might be able to develop where students can go to high school here, uh, go two years at SCF, two years at uh, USF, and then go into either pharmacy or osteopathic medicine or dentistry, and then go on and do their residency in one of the local hospitals and, and practice right here in our community and never have to leave. So I think this is a very important aspect that will grow our area. And finally, we're trying to be a world-class university for the area. We met on just yesterday with uh, Benderson Development Corporation and Randy Benderson. I know they're building a world-class rowing facility, uh, and we're trying to work out ways that our hospitality program, our business program, and our education program can work with them, offering uh, classrooms with a lot of um, uh, hands-on practice for our students, but also help grow that world-class facility and the mall and all the hotels and restaurants that we look forward to bringing to this area. And finally, I do want to thank, again, Kiwanis for having us here. Uh, you have at your tables 
our view book that talks about our different programs from bachelor's to master's degrees. And I know a lot of you have offices. If you would take one along and just put it in your office. Uh, when I first came here eight years ago, we found out that only 3% of the people even knew they had a four-year, that they had an undergraduate and master's degree university in the area, USF Sarasota Manatee. I think we've gotten a little better on that, but there are still people that don't realize that we are here right on 41 across from the Sarasota Airport. So please take this and, and maybe you will have some younger people that may be taking um, pick with this up and decide to attend our university and um, also have, um, it may, if any of you want to attend, we also have a number of advisory boards. I see Mona Jane in the audience, who is a member of our community leadership uh, council. We really rely on leaders to help us move forward. So thank you again, and I hope you will be involved with us, and I look, do look forward to answering your questions. out what the knife was for. It's to ring the bell at the end. So hopefully we'll get it out of harm's way. We have a gavel, but it didn't make it over this morning. A little behind the scenes glitches. Um, thank you, Dr. Jones. And one of the things um, that caught me in her speech just now was the, the intro that she said, what we used to have. And what are you hearing a lot, and there's a theme that's happening in our community is we had a lot of used to haves and now we're moving into a time of where we're going and what we're what we're doing now in this spirit of collaboration and one of the um, things that's happened in Manatee County School District is we have a new superintendent would you raise your hand if you took part in the superintendent the community superintendent search well there you go um, at every table there's someone here this board chose to do this in a, as a completely open process, and each board member selected four members of our community to serve in a, as a volunteer from this process. And um, we never had done this before. There were no closed door sessions or meetings. Every individual board member who met with every candidate met in a room that was open to the public, to the press, and was recorded. So um, at a time in Manatee County's history that's so vital for the education of our children, it has truly been an honor to have been part of that process, to be on the board at a time when our new superintendent would be chosen. And probably as I leave the board, it'll be the one single most important decision that I've ever made in service to this community. And it is my honor to introduce our new superintendent of schools, Mr. Rick Mills. And I'd also like to thank his wife, Jessica, who's here today who just flew in and is here already at a, an event on her weekend off. Thank you and welcome, Jessica. Well, good afternoon. I've been on the job 51 days so far, and as you know, things have been pretty quiet in the school district. <laughs> not much going on, you're not reading much, right? Well, I'm really excited to be here, but I will say in the last few days, I've finally found an opportunity for a few days where I haven't had to get up in the morning, look at my tie, and say, how will this look on TV or in a paper? <laughs> so it's a real pleasure to be here today with such a distinguished group of folks in our community, in our community leaders, in our, our legislative leaders. And as um, uh, Senator Dietert said, I'm going to defer all questions on education and funding to our other great senators here today. And um, I'm still trying to digest what's come out of that and um, look, look very much forward to implementation of that in the school district. So today I'd really like to focus on where I've been focusing my time as superintendent and my attention in the last 50 days. As you know, I've presented to the board uh, during the interview process an intent, if selected as a superintendent, to implement a 100-day entry plan, uh, which is going pretty well in the first 50 days. And I would encourage you to take a look at the website of all the community members, community organizations, and uh, individual folks that I've met with, as well as the 30 schools that I've been out to so far. I have the ultimate goal to get to all of our schools by the end of the school year, and I'm hitting about two a day and about five to seven a week, and uh, very excited on what I'm seeing out in the schools. We got great teachers, principals, staff, and faculty in all our schools, and there's really, uh, really great and exciting things going on. And in spite of all of our challenges that we have in front of us, uh, just in the past few days, I've just been thoroughly excited about some of the things I've attended. This morning, 
Uh, I was at Freedom Elementary School for the engineering STEM competition on our water towers. Uh, last night I was at uh, Rollette for Pirates of Penzance performance. Uh, the Golden Heron Awards the, uh, Thursday evening for our seniors who were recognized and the great things that they were doing in, in many of the uh, areas in our, in our school system. And last week, stake, stake, uh, Take Stock in Children, uh, which was another great event and organization as well that I was just very excited to be a part of. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been out in the community. It's my intent to rebuild our trust and our transparency with our community and invest and move forward around leveraging our community in the capacity of delivering high quality education and ultimately to have shared accountability uh, of all of us as we move forward. I've been out and met uh, with various organizations. I've been to all, virtually all the Kiwana organizations, Tiger Bay, uh, the Women of Manatee County Republican Club, Sons of Italy, the Marine League, I spoke at the Tea Party. So I've been really getting out and get to meet our community members, very much part of uh, the five components of the entry plan, and the first three being to uh, listen, to learn, and to share about myself as we move forward uh, in the next 100 days. Ultimately, at the end, um, on June 11th, I will present my findings of uh, my 100 days. I will also share the uh, transition plan, economic recovery uh, uh, plan that's been written by the transition team. I will have that in the next couple of weeks. Ultimately, uh, the implied task as well as the stated task and goals in my 100-day entry plan is to uh, get everything out, all our challenges, present that. Because if you read the book, uh, Good to Great by Jim Collins, he probably his most famous quote in there is, uh, you gotta get the right, seats, right people in the right seats on the bus. And we're very much doing that as we're transforming our organizational structure and looking at all our team externally, internally, to bring in a great team that's gonna transform and lead us to greatness as a school district. But he also talks in his book about brutal facts. And the brutal facts are, uh, you have to know what your challenges are in an organization in order to achieve a greatness uh, of that organization. You also have to share those brutal facts, understand them, and build around that and upon that to achieve greatness. So I hope to achieve, at the end of the 100 days, a presentation that, that really lays out our challenges as a school district, lays out those brutal facts, and how at that point we're going to, to plan and build on that for greatness as a school district. So I'd just like to, to uh, close in just saying that uh, all the challenges that we have, and we know our biggest one is fiscally, and you know, basically find something new every day around that. Uh, we're gonna get to the bottom line of that in the next uh, few weeks, and we're gonna move forward on it. We're gonna build a really great budget next year with our board, and move forward financially and implementing all the systems that we put in place. And we're gonna create that great vision, that strategy, we're going to strategically align through the district all the way from the district down to the school level. We're going to allocate all our resources and alignment around that. We're going to look at our policies. We're going to look at our professional development. And we're going to take all those plans, we're going to build them, and we're going to align everything to that. And that's what we're going to be focused on as we move forward to greatness. And I'm very confident about our ability to do that. We have all the key ingredients here in the county for success. We've got great community members, we've got great citizens, our, our great legislative leaders, uh, our organizations that are involved. This is very much a testimony here of, of people's support in creating a great uh, educational structure and district uh, in Manatee County. So I feel very privileged and honored uh, to be here as the superintendent. Uh, I think it's a great challenge, but a great opportunity as well. I know that we will achieve greatness and we will be one of the best districts in the state. Thank you. One of the other partnerships that we have with um, our community is a program where every dollar is matched, 50% here that we raise is matched with the state, and it's called Take Stock in Children. And we actually have our director of Take Stock in Children here today, Diana Dill. Could you stand up, please, Diana? And just as a, a testimony to community, Diana Dill and I met uh, probably over a decade ago on a playground, and we became the SAC and PTO chair of the Braden River Elementary School. So we've been working along side by side for quite a long time for our children. And um, this year, and I'm actually on my second student, and if you have about 30 minutes a week and would like to make a difference in someone's life, these children that are matched for these scholarships are matched in middle school. And the difference is that they get a mentor who checks in on them every week. 
someone that's not related to them or doesn't have to tell them how well they're doing, but someone that coaches them, someone that gives them another perspective from the community, and um, sometimes it's just a word of encouragement, sometimes it's just saying that I believe in you. And I know for me, it was uh, a teacher that made a difference in my life. Otherwise, I don't know that I would have gone to college. I'm the first person in my family to graduate high school. I'm the first person in my family that ever went to college. So I found myself again, take stock and children mentor. My first student is now in her second year at SCF. And um, she's doing quite well. And she still texts me pretty regularly, so I check in with her. My second student is at Manatee School of the Arts. And Dr. Bill Jones is here. And just so that you know what a school can do, when um, my student at Manatee School of the Arts needed some extra help, his assistant principal, Mr. Devine, immediately worked on her elective schedule to make sure that she had the resources needed for an upcoming FCAT test. That's just a tip of the iceberg of how a volunteer sees something, communicates to something, because a student who's struggling with a test blends, crawls right underneath this carpet if they can. If you remember back when you were that age, you never raised your hand and said, gee, I need some extra help. One of the things that USF is doing, the ratio of freshman class, 14 to 1. So if you're a student that gets lost in a lecture hall, you have a choice of where you can go. For some students, they can learn online. Um, I've known some children that you could probably put them in a tent, and if they had wireless, they would keep learning. You know, I mean, they, they passed me by in third grade, so I've, I've, I've been the witness of it. So I just want to say, um, you can find out information about Take Stock and Children from Diana, but you can also find out on our school website, and it is an amazing program. So before we get into our questions, we need to um, thank Mr. Clapsaddle and his assistant Richard today. This is their weekend. I spend a lot of time with this crew because they are always filming and giving up their time on the weekend to make sure that this is documented so that we can get this information out to our community. Any questions? Just come on. The question is that the resources that we're spending for remediation, that's also in the K-12 program as well as in colleges. And um, part of that success and improving that dropout rate and is in the remediation. So in, if you would like to um, address yeah, that in the budget. A, a a quick comment on it. Uh, yes, a lot of money is spent on remediation. 36 million in direct cost. Indirect cost is 51 million dollars. And so when the Senate put out its first budget, we backed out half of that 36 because we were moving away from the traditional remediation. What we ended up with at the end of session was a recognition that uh, our school system should be able to produce college-ready students. So if you're a freshman as of 2003, 2004, then you'll not have to be tested for to see if you need remediation. You have the option, if I'm a student, I say, you know what, why don't you test me? I'm not sure my skills are up to par. But to your point, Sandy, to get, we, we need to have the confidence in our K-12 system. And, and we're saying, if, look, if you're in at that point, and you go to college, we expect that you're ready to go into a credit-bearing course, and we expect that college, if you need a little help, to either do some co-requisite, some lab work, or some modular help. Thank you. Next. Oh, sorry. Oh, sure, sorry. Just pull me. I'd also like to remind us that some number of these students who come to us that require some level of remediation are adult students who've been out of school for some time. And I suspect if any one of us sat down here today and tried to take a basic algebra exam, many of us might test into that remedial class as well. So Senator Galvano is right on that for many of these students, it's really a matter of that little extra help that they might need to remember what they once learned. From a K through 12 perspective, uh, one of the, some of the data I've looked at is that Manatee County Schools uh, is very competitive and does a, a great job in, in the middle years and the high school years. Our real challenge is, is the pre-K through third grade, particularly around reading. Uh, we spend a, 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 a sub substantive amount of money on remediating our students, particularly around reading by third grade. So we're shifting that direction, as I mentioned, uh, being strategically aligned. We're, we'll go back and look at our district strategic plan. Uh, but we're also going to write an academic strategic plan that's purely focused on student achievement outcomes and performance 
uh, and gets right down to the heart of how we're going to effectively deliver instruction in the classroom to produce those great outcomes. So we're going to realign uh, how we do our pre-K through uh, grade level three, particularly around reading and have a strategy initiative so that we're not so much in the remediation component, but more proactively delivering that instruction so our, our students by third grade are at or above grade level. I just want to briefly say that this is a way that we are not overlapping with State College of Florida. You heard we are having freshmen for the first time this fall, but uh, we will not be doing any remediation. We have uh, students, they have to have a minimum uh, GPA and test score and so on so that they will not require remediation. We feel at State College of Florida and the school systems are able to handle that much better than we can at our level. So that's where we're not going to be overlapping in any way on that. I think Deborah Bailey, you had a question? Thank you. Deborah Bailey heads up a Project Heart in Manatee County and are you still based at the Harley Full Service Center? And one of the things that many of the Kiwanis clubs and other clubs have done are collect clothes for the clothes closet as well as um, other support that she has needed. And her question today is about some of the other um, avenues. And MTI, the average student that goes to MTI is close to 30 years old. So when they do fall off that cliff, Deb, it takes a few years out there before they come back. And part of our economic recovery and prosperity is being ready for work or for college. So Senator Dieter. Well, just to throw in a little food for thought, <clears throat> what may surprise you that's in the education budget statewide are mentoring programs. We pay for big brothers, big sisters, boys and girls clubs. We even give money to the Girl Scouts because they have a mentoring component. Then, of course, we pay for pre-K. And the new thing we're doing this year Take stock and children is included in that and all of the little components that are designed to help a kid other than just basic you know curriculum uh, another key ingredient of our plan on the foster care thing is to have a community college and university component and it's a mentoring we're going to call them coaches and we put money in the budget to pay for one on every community college and university campus and they will be a resource for kids who are foster care kids, homeless kids, kids with problems where they'd have a resource. So you'd have a person on campus that's your personal coach who can say these services are available to you or what kind of help do you need and frankly when it comes to the holidays and to not brand kids like stamp them homeless or foster care just to send out a friendly memo and say, for all of the, those of you who aren't going home for Thanksgiving, when the campus may evacuate, we're gonna have a little something at the community center. So there's that kind of new help coming and I think we're headed in the right direction. And through our advising and outreach programs at the State College of Florida, we do try to work individually with students and connect them with resources in the community. So it's all those resources you defined earlier that are so important to us. And we try to nurture those relationships as well to make sure that we have as many opportunities that we can direct our students to as possible because we get confronted with quite a lot of different challenges that there's, those students are confronted with and we wanna make sure that we do try to help them get the, need, the help they need so they can stay in school. Julie mentioned earlier at USF Saracen and Manatee our very low um, student to faculty ratio and I mentioned business business classes on some state universities may be in a lecture hall of 400 students and at USF Saracen and Manatee our largest business class is anywhere from 60 to 100 and that's the rarity there may be a couple of those most of them are about 30 students and we also have an early alert system with our academic advisors we get to know students really one-on-one -on, -one on a small campus okay thank you Okay. Again, thank you very much for attending this lunch and, um, with, and thank you to our special guest speakers. It's really and truly an honor to be here with you guys and, 
and thank you for answering all of our questions. Thank you to Jane, Julie, and all of the Kiwanis members that are out there that I apologize I didn't uh, kind of name you in the beginning of this, but again, without, without you guys, without the Kiwanis uh, members, this wouldn't be possible. So we're a few minutes late, but the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. And I am being joined by Mrs. Jane Grace. Jane, can you tell us about the Kiwanis event today? Well, today's event is to honor some of the people in the educational field and, of course, Senator Dietert and Senator Galvano, who will be coming back from Tallahassee. Uh, hopefully, they'll have some good news for us about the funding. And uh, many of the other people in joining us today are heads of the various schools within the county, and we're going to hear from them uh, as far as what are their future plans? What do they hope this, we can move this county around? And I know Mr. Mills has said he wants to make this school number one. So I'm curious to see or listen to what he might have to say. And you have a lot of people attending today's event. Why do you think they're coming to support this? Well, number one, I think they're really curious about what's happening to the educational system in this county, as well they should be. We have had some rocky roads, so um, I, I believe that's part of it. The other is to, the, they're concerned about the children, and all everything that we do in Kiwanis involves children. And I, so that's my thought on what today is all about. And as a former teacher, you've always been an advocate for children. Oh, yes, had 31 years, 31 years. And I have to tell you, I loved every day that I taught. Of course, I wasn't teaching under many of the constraints that I hear about in this school system, but uh, I just love teaching. Well, and thank you so much for continuing to be an advocate for children in hosting today's event. Well, you're more than welcome. It's a good time. What does today mean to you? It means to me that we have a community that wants to have the best education possible for our children. And I feel real privileged to be in a position to, to help nudge that along. And I'm so glad so many other people are here feeling that same way. And you've always been a strong proponent of parent involvement. Yes, I am. And how do you think parents should get involved in their children's education? Well, as much as possible. And certainly when they have their children, to be involved in their homework, make sure that it's getting it done. Uh, come in uh, to, the, to the schools and uh, have a relationship with the teachers and the staff. And uh, you know, come to school board meetings, watch the school board, and provide us you know input. We we as far we far from knowing everything, and the more input we get, the better job we can do. So, what are you hoping to hear today from our senators and our superintendent and the presidents of the college? Well, I I expect to hear from them. Hope to hear from them at least that you know they appreciate you know all the parent involvement. They they appreciate you know the community involvement and the community that is doing their very best to provide the best education for our children. Well, thank you for continuing to be an advocate for our families and children. Okay, Sheila, thank you for being here. Okay, all right. Thank you. Senator Dieter, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, it's my pleasure. And what are you going to be sharing with us today? Um, I'm looking forward to the questions from the audience, but mainly I'll be talking about the very busy legislative session we had this year good things happened in education. It's always a pleasure to have some money to work with. I did some bills for guidance counselors I'd like to talk about. And then of course we had a busy year with foster care kids and commerce and all the other things we do. So it's good to share that information with, with the folks back home. And you've always been an advocate for our families and our parents. What motivates you? Well, I, I really had no intention of ever getting into politics. I only got in because I'm a mom and I was unhappy with the schools decades ago and ran for school board and that's, that was my involvement. So I kind of relate to parent, children, education issues. What are some of the bills that you're most proud of that you've worked with? Well, this year um, I'm so proud of the foster care legislation we did. We did two bills. One bill that they named after me extends foster care from age 18 to age 21 for absolutely no new money, which is pretty a pretty miraculous leap. <laughs> so that that's my biggest bill of the year. Well, thank you so much. You've always been an advocate for our families, and we appreciate all the hard work that you do. Well, thanks. I appreciate hearing that. <laughs> Dr. Jones, thank you so much for joining us today.
I'm very happy to be here and happy to have an opportunity to talk about the University of South Florida, Saracen Manatee. What are some things you're going to tell us about the college? I'm going to, first of all, thank the uh, legislators and particularly our local delegation for all they've done to help the university this time for our students, our faculty, and our staff, and also the whole community. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about some of the new programming that we're going to have on campus. What is some of the new programming that you're excited to share? Uh, we will be starting science programs in uh, collaboration with Mount Marine Laboratories. We're building science laboratories there and having science for the first time on our campus. And then we are also having freshmen for the first time this fall. Uh, and that's something that we used to be just upper division and masters, and now we will be having freshmen and sophomore courses on our campus. That is very exciting. Yes, and we hope that we can really serve the Sarasota Manatee community and keep our students here rather than having a brain drain of them leaving our community to go to a four-year comprehensive university. Keeping the kids here locally. Definitely. We have a lot of talent we want to keep here. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and it sounds like you're doing exciting things at the university. I enjoy talking with you. Thank you. I am being joined by Diana Dill. Diana, thank you so much for attending today. Thank you for having me here. And what does today mean for you? Well, today is a great opportunity for all the educational leaders to come together and to discuss what's happening currently in our society and our community, and then what's on the horizons for our community as well in education. And you actually work with our school district on helping children. Yes, I work with Take Stock in Children, which is a college scholarship and mentoring program for low-income at-risk students. And we have a phenomenal program where our volunteers really help our students break the cycle of poverty through mentoring and education. And so it's very important to me what is happening in education today. How many children are actually in your program right now? We have 150 students in the Manatee County School District district in grades 6 through 12 and then we have about 250 students that are in college utilizing their scholarships. And that would not have been possible without your program. Absolutely. It took the volunteers in our community, it took the generous community to donate the scholarship dollars and our school district to oversee the entire program and you know when everybody works together we all win. And definitely for those children and those family members. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for attending today. I'm looking forward to hearing good things from our leaders. So am I. Thank you so much. And I am being joined by Ms. Julia Rarebar. Julie, what a wonderful event you're hosting today. Thank you, Sheila. Thanks for attending and all your support and helping to set up. Oh, my pleasure. Now, what are we, can we expect from today's event? This is the first meeting right out of the end of the legislative session. So we have two sitting senators who will be reporting on the status of education for Manatee County and what that means for our students. We have two college presidents from our two local colleges and we have our new Manatee County Superintendent of Schools, Mr. Rick Mills. So we are going to get a snapshot today of where we are and where we're going for the future of education. It has never been so critical as it is right now and this year is an exceptional year because for the first time in many years we've had extra funding in education. Education. So what are we going to do with that? And for Manatee County, we're at a critical crossroads. It's very important. And you have done this event two years in a row. So there are talkers and there are doers. So you've actually been a doer for this for two years. Can you tell us a little bit about hosting this event? Sure. You know, my community service began in Manatee County with my first home, which was auctioned for the Boys and Girls Club, and it was my introduction to Manatee County. This is a community that cares about its people and its children, so it's been a great adventure for me to have started out and been so welcomed and received in Manatee County. My service in Kiwanis was a natural fit. It blended into what I was doing in the schools with children, and Kiwanis is an entire organization that's volunteer-based and totally dedicated to children. So I've been a Kiwanis advisor, key club advisor, I've been past president of this Kiwanis club and today is an interesting collaboration. We have Kiwanis clubs throughout Manatee County and we have representatives, three mem members of our school board represent three different clubs in Manatee County and this is about coming together for what's best for children and that's what we need to do. We don't have any other political agenda other than getting out there for our children. And our families also. You're a strong proponent of parent involvement. Absolutely. I've been the room mom, the PTO mom, and I, I definitely have earned my badge of merit in the volunteer world. Yes, you have. And as a school board member also, you're still continuing on. I still am. And um, 
this year has been a, an interesting year for me. It's sort of bittersweet in many ways because my children will walk across the stage at graduation and with them go all of their classmates and friends that I have known since they were three and four years old. So um, this will be probably one of the most memorable graduations for me and to have the honor of serving at all of the graduations means that for all of the friends that I've known throughout this community, I will be standing there and get to hug them as they walk across the stage. So I plan to have um, not just Kleenex, but I think maybe paper towels, the extra bounties up my sleeve this year. <laughs> well, thank you so much for hosting this again and thank you for so much for all that you do. Thank you, thank you. Welcome to today's event. Thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to be here. I look forward to the opportunity to tell everybody about the great things that are happening at the State College of Florida. And what are some of those things that you're going to be sharing with us today? Well, obviously, we want to thank our legislators for how hard they worked on our behalf this year in the legislative session. And um, I want to talk a little bit about what the money that we get from the state and from the taxpayers does for the students at the State College of Florida. Outline some of the outstanding performance that we've had on our students that have graduated this year. Um, we're very proud of our, for example, our Model UN team that won first in the southeast region of the United States, 44 colleges and universities in that region and our team came in first place for their position paper. So it's pretty amazing. Two out of the 50 Coca-Cola scholars in the whole of the United States came from the State College of Florida. We're very proud of that number. Three of the all-academic team in the state of Florida came from the State College of Florida, 10%. We're very happy with that number. So it's, you know, academic performance is my goal, something that I want to be able to have all the opportunity in the world to tell people about because we're very proud. And that happens for one reason, because we have professors and teachers that teach. They're passionate about it. They're not researching. They're not doing um, a lot of grant work. They're at the college because they want to teach and the proof is in the pudding. Our students are showing it. Our athletic teams also have academic scholars that were recognized this year, as well as athletic excellence. Three of our five teams went to the state championship and one of our teams went to the national championship. Well, you should be very proud. What are you hoping to hear from the other speakers today? Well, one of the things we've been talking a lot about with one another is how we can put the pieces and parts of what each of us do together to create a synergistic effect in our community. Each of us has our niche, each of, it ha each of us has what we do well, but we still have gaps. And we need to figure out who's in the best position to fill those gaps so we can take the money that we have, spread it further, find a way to create opportunities for students so they can live and stay in this area because we know if they stay in this area for education, they will stay in this area when they get a job and when they start working. That's Wonderful. Cool. So helping our community. Exactly. Thank you so much for joining thank us. You. My pleasure. Senator Galvano, thank you so much for joining I'm us glad today. To be here. I'm very so glad. What are you hoping to share or learn from today? Well, I'm hoping to share with uh, the people here today the uh, success that we had in this last legislative session, especially with regards to education. Uh, as you may know, I chaired the Education Appropriations uh, Committee, and so we have a lot to talk about within that, that budget. It's one of the best in, in 10 years. It's good to have uh, some extra dollars to fund programs that are important to not just K through 12, but all the way through the university system. So hopefully we'll be able to talk about that today and, and maybe some other issues that, that arose during session and uh, that we addressed. And we have a large crowd here today. Our community is coming out to support education. How does that make you feel? It makes me feel fantastic. I've, I've long believed that everything good or bad in society relates back to education or the lack thereof. Whether it's uh, our prison population or the innovations and success that, that people have in the marketplace and the economy, it all ties back to education. So if we prioritize education in our community, at our state level and at the national level, we'll be doing the right thing. And you've always been a proponent of parent involvement and supporting their children. How do you feel about parents working with their children and with their children's schools? I think that's vitally important. The one common denominator of successful students is parental involvement. And a lot of times people will compare public schools to private schools, and really it's not the bricks and mortar institution, but it's the parental involvement. If parents are involved, a child will be successful. And what are you most proud of right now in your new position? Well, I'm most proud of the fact that we were able to prioritize education within the budget to increase K-12 through funding at $1.1 billion, to uh, 
fund the university systems to, to make sure we prioritize real life experience in school by, by uh, increasing funding for technology and tying education to future success and career success. A comprehensive approach. Absolutely, absolutely, and we, saw, we have themes that go from pre-K all the way through the university system so that we're approaching it uh, globally as opposed to piecemeal with the primary goal of having a successful future come out of the education system in the state of Florida. So you're helping our children to be able to compete not only locally but globally? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, that's the world today and they have to be able to compete globally. First of all, I want them to beat the other states, but then we want to be number one in the world. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, glad to be here. Mr. Mills, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, absolute pleasure to be here. Any opportunity that I have to share our vision and where we're going as a school district, uh, I always look forward to. What are some things you're gonna share with us today? I'm gonna to talk more about, uh, I'm gonna to defer to our legislation on the issues that came out of the recent bill for, but I'm really going to focus on where we're at as a school district, my first 50 days, where we're going in the next uh, 50 days, and sharing the vision and how we're going to move forward as a school district. And you came into a school district that had some challenges. You put out a 100-day plan, and you're 50 days into that plan. How are things progressing? Well, it's going as ex exactly as I had anticipated and laid out in the plan. I've been to over 30 schools. I've been out in the community, meeting the community individually, collectively, and organizations. and really learning and listening and, and sharing a little bit about myself. So I'm accomplishing all those goals as, as anticipated. And um, I'm also getting my hands around what some of our real challenges are. And of course our transition team has done the same and we'll bring that together and move forward on that. You've had vast prior experiences with other school districts and in the military. How has that prepared you to where you are today? Well, I consider myself a blended skills leader between the military experience and education. So I feel like I have a, a, a good repertoire of skills to, to lead a school district uh, based upon those that I've learned in the military and uh, my 13th year now in education upcoming. So I think it's unique in, in, the, uh, in the aspects of being able to incorporate uh, how to deliver processes and systems and strategic vision in an organization and, and build great organizational health that are two key essential uh, needs for a great organization. Why is today important for everyone that's in attendance? I, I just think it's important anytime our, our community leaders, our elected leaders can uh, gather in front of a group of folks and really share the vision, what our challenges are, where we're going, and to open that line of communications and transparency to build that community trust as we collectively move forward here in Manatee County. And you have an overwhelming position, but have you had any time for fun? Very little. Uh, my wife is still teaching up in Chicago, and she's actually just landed now at Sarasota Airport. So she's in route here, but uh, it's been fortuitous for me in that 100 days to be able to have all this time available to get out and accomplish everything. And that is uh, quite a bit of time, but it's been extremely rewarding and it's been extremely beneficial for me uh, to get out there and get to, to know all the folks in the county and in the district and uh, to move forward. Well, we are very happy that you're here, not only today, but for our school district. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor to serve as a superintendent. Thank you. Thank you.